So, um, my name is Morgan Reed. Uh, hello and welcome to our briefing today, where we'll discuss the state of encryption policy. Uh, not a minor issue at all. Um, we're co-hosting this briefing, um, so it is a joint effort between the App Association and the Family Online Safety Institute. Um, I'm the president of the App Association. We're a trade group here in DC that represents about 5,000 small businesses around the world. Um, we develop all the software that you um, hopefully are dependent on right now to watch this. Um, all your mobile apps, your mobile plus cloud, um, they're all built by my members. Um, and really for us, our software is the connective tissue for the mobile lives that we all live from online banking to digital health and delivery services. Um, it's an interesting time for us. And so our first concern is that you and your families are safe healthy, and you can probably hear my five-year-old in the background. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hope, hopefully I, that will stop momentarily. Um, but I will turn it over for a moment to my, um, my co-host, Stephen Balcom. For those of you who don't know, Stephen is the founder and CEO of the Family Online Safety Institute, also known as FOSI. Um, prior to FOSI, uh, Stephen was the founder and CEO of the Internet Content Rating Association, and before that, he was the first executive director of the Recreational Software Advisory Council. Um, so he has a lot of experience in advocating for internet policies that protect children, especially. Thanks for co-hosting this event with us today, um, Stephen, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Morgan. Really appreciate it and uh, really admire the work of your organization and what you've been up to. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I want to extend my good wishes and hopes that you and your family are well and that you are following the guidance of your public health officials. Uh, so with that, I uh, just want to say a few words about FOSI. We are an international nonprofit organization that works to make the online world safer for kids and their families. Uh, we convene leaders in industry, government, and the nonprofit sectors to collaborate and innovate new solutions and policies in the field of online safety. Um, so we talk about safety, privacy, and security as being the bedrock upon which digital and media literacy and ultimately digital citizenship can be built. Uh, and exercising our rights as well as our responsibilities online depend on how much we can trust the apps and the platforms and the devices that we use every day. So we see encryption as falling right in the middle of the debate over safety on the one side and privacy on the other. And it's a debate that has become particularly polarized here in Washington. Now, on the one hand, law enforcement says it is stymied by encryption technology and wants tech companies to offer them a backdoor for important investigations, including into the creation and dissemination of child sexual abuse imagery and to prevent terrorist attacks. On the other hand, companies have prioritized privacy, not only for the benefit of their customers and users, but because they have been encouraged to do so by legislators and regulators in the US and around the world. So any backdoor to encrypted messages could be used by malicious actors just as easily as it could be by law enforcement. And not surprisingly, the media focuses on the attention grabbing cases that involve the might of the federal government against the services and devices that the public relies on every day. Now, what we hope to do today is to go behind the headlines to look at a number of ways in which encryption is used to protect vulnerable communities and to look at how less publicized examples of encryption shape our lives in the United States and around the world. And we've convened speakers who have personal experience with the benefits of encryption, as well as experts who have laid out specific areas where we can advance the conversation. We hope the discussion today elaborates on the ways technology companies are already working with law enforcement in ways that don't require breaking encryption, including best practices and communication materials in order to assist in investigation and comply with warrants. Uh, we also hope to provide a well-rounded perspective on encryption and show how it can protect vulnerable populations while highlighting the ways 
that increased resources and education could move us beyond the current familiar arguments. And of course, we wanna respond to as many of your questions as we possibly can. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Morgan, and uh, please take it away. Well, thank you very much. So um, we have to address the elephant in the room. Um, we have uh, at current count 132 participants all on Zoom. Um, uh, as we know, Zoom has had its fair share of privacy and cybersecurity concerns in the last two weeks, not the least of which was uh, the, the announcement that end-to-end -end encryption um, wasn't exactly what uh, those of us in the technology field considered to be end-to-end -end encryption when it came to Zoom. Um, the Federal Trade Commission is being called, there's been calls to have the FTC launch an investigation, and there's certainly been uh, a lot of bad press doled out um, for Zoom. But it's a really interesting reminder to all of us that when you build a digital product or service, you actually need to do privacy by design. And I think it's pretty clear by the statements of the CEO and by others that that wasn't the case for Zoom. But it also brings up an important distinction as well. We don't always need end-to-end -end encryption, but law enforcement has painted uh, these disaster scenarios where reams of communications data are encrypted without a master key, creating some vast playground for criminals. One staffer asked me, um, what about the entire net of Internet of Things? What happens when all of that is totally encrypted? Well, one of the main reasons that this isn't a realistic scenario is that it's often not useful to use end-to-end -end encryption. And one of our panelists, John, will talk a little bit about um, some of the resources that are needed and the ways that we can make it um, easier to put end-to-end -end or encryption at some level into hardware and the cost that those maintain on a computational level. Now, this is a recorded webinar and we want lots of people to use it, but we don't want anybody Zoom bombing us today. So we are making this, uh, taking a calculated risk and making this widely available. Um, but Madeline uh, Zick, who's on the call right now, She's there to hopefully maintain the peace and make sure that we don't have any um, inopportune Zoom visitors. That said, we're mostly here to talk about strong encryption. Um, that, that's the technical protection mechanism that shields sensitive personal communications, data files, and transactions. Um, I think most of our audience has some basic understanding of what encryption is, but think of it as a way to make it hard for someone else to look at something that they're not supposed to look at. Um, what we want to hit a little bit today is the role that encryption plays in our day-to-day -day lives. And also, you heard uh, Stephen Balcom mention this. Uh, we thought instead of nerding out on the technical aspects of this whole issue, we'd look a little bit about the ways that encryption intersects with our lives. We have all know about banking and we know about our medical records to a certain degree, but how are the other ways in which particularly vulnerable communities benefit from the kind of technological capability that end-to-end -end or encrypted data, either at rest or in motion, can provide. Um, and so I think that's really the place that we wanted to do. We wanted to make this session a little bit more about real-world experiences, real-world stories, real people, and the way that it impacts them. And the panel that we have today is pretty stunning. Um, we have Carlos Gutierrez, he's the Deputy Director and General Counsel of LGBT Tech. Um, he is one of the leaders in this space and is truly a voice for reason. Jen Daskal, who is fac um, Faculty Director uh, of Tech Law and Security Program at American University. Many of you have seen Jen Daskal in her various appearances before congressional panels and others, talking about the DOJ and the perspective of encryption both as a uh, legal scholar and an academic who's really dug into the ramifications of all of this. Um, Elena Roberts, she's the technology safety legal manager at the National Network to End Domestic Violence um, and can really give us some insights into the ways in which um, protection is critical as people who are in abusive situations need to find a way out. And then finally, um, John Wilbanks, who is the chief commons officer at Sage Bionetworks. Um, John is here to make sure that we um, stay technologically truthful and to give us a sense about kind of where the scope and sphere is as we look at the ability to use um, huge data sets in a safe and secure way 
as we deal with the current ongoing um, pandemic, but also future biological issues that we may need to face and also maybe cure cancer. Um, and so with that, I really wanna start with some questions for Carlos, um, because I think it's something that most people wouldn't think, well, why does the LGBT community care about encryption? So talk to us a little bit about what's the risks right now in the era of pa in the in the pandemic situation we're in where where are those intersectional points where um, encryption becomes vital for the safety of the lgbt community carlos sure thank you very much and thank you guys very much for hosting this really important talk and uh, and letting me be a part of it um the lgbt community definitely faces some very specific risk when it comes to encryption and the need for encryption um for many LGBTQ individuals, um, online is where they turn to first when they start exploring their identity. Uh, unfortunately, for many of the individuals that are exploring coming out or are thinking about coming out, they may face hostile situations at home, um, at school, in their local churches and communities. So encryption uh, and knowing that their communications over Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp are encrypted um, allows them to have a sense of security that they can have open conversations with others uh, without running the risk of being outed unintentionally or without running the risk of um, being found out by hostile family members. So there is a, there's a need for privacy from a community perspective as people explore their identity. Um, another area that where LGBT people really need encryption, including um, more as importantly or more importantly transgender communities is access to healthcare and access to doctors. Um, we have seen over and over again in small, uh, smaller rural towns where you may have one doctor that treats your family, your parents, your children, you know, your grandmother and knows every cousin you've ever had, that LGBT people are just not comfortable being honest with their healthcare providers about this. So they turn to online resources. Um, you know, if somebody who may have be HIV positive, there may not be a local doctor in their town that has the resources and the skills to treat them in a way that they would need to be treated. So they would reach out over um, online communications to doctors in other areas that might be able to be more sensitive to their specific needs or their specific diseases. Um, overlayering all this is also discrimination in terms of job discrimination and other places. You know, more than half the states in the United States, in, in the United States alone, you can still be fired from your job or denied housing. Uh, for your sexual orientation or gender identity. So there's a lot of areas where the LGBT community is exposed in a way that other communities um, may not be, mainly because we're one of the few minority communities where you can experience discrimination in your own home and you can be you know, targeted or you can be, uh, you may need these tools even in your own home around your own family who may not be supportive. Well, you had an interesting statistic in your op-ed in Morning Consult where you said that um, same-sex activity is still illegal in 76 countries around the world. Um, we know that's not the case here in the United States, but um, any kind of mandated backdoor, what do you see that presents as a risk for kind of our globalized uh, mobile ecosystem? Well, I think the biggest risk, and you just pointed it out, is that, you know, the legal, you know, in the United States, you may look at what's legal and, you know, and, and not be worried, but in other countries, absolutely, LGBT people are criminalized for being gay. Um, in some countries, you can even be put to death for being gay. Um, in Saudi Arabia, Iran, you know, up until recently in Uganda, had to kill the gays bill that they were trying to pause, pass. So the question becomes, you know, when you talk about why do you have to worry about this if you're not doing illegal behavior is, illegal behavior can be defined very broadly and very differently depending on where you are. So my being gay may not be illegal here, but if I travel to one of these countries for work or for any other reason, I, automatically my behavior becomes illegal uh, just by who I am. And because I'm not used to this, it is not something that's gonna be top of mind as I enter these countries. So a back door mm. that allows people would harm US citizens traveling abroad uh, so, you know, well, you would have to be aware of the shifting landscape of legal, legal issues in different countries to, you know, to know when your, your communication would be subject to be encrypted through this legal backdoor. Hmm. Well, um, fortunately, on this panel, we actually have somebody who is uh, well aware of the shifting legal vagaries of the uh, international ramifications. Jen, um, uh, Professor Daskal, I should say, uh, talk to us a little bit about what are those domestic and international ramifications 
And what is it the DOJ says investigators need, but what does law enforcement really need? Well, great. So thank you um, as well for having me here and for inviting me to be part of this panel. But I think what we need, it's worth kind of stepping back and thinking about um, what are the problems that some of the proposals to mandate decryption in various ways are trying to solve and how do we balance the proposed or the, the, the claimed benefits from those proposals with, with the costs. Um, and so when I think about that, I, I think back to a report that I did now two years ago. It was, it was released in July of 2000, almost two years ago, 2018. It was called um, Low Hanging Fruit, um, Digital-Based Solutions to the Digital Evidence Divide. And it was a report that I did in conjunction with CSIS and Will Carter. And we looked at the challenges that federal, state, and local law enforcement faces in dealing with digital evidence. And what we found was that there is and, and continues to be a significant problem that law enforcement faces in dealing with digital evidence. But according to a survey that we did, the most significant problem was accessing sought after evidence, meaning specifically figuring out which service provider or third party entity had the relevant evidence and how to obtain it. And that was a much bigger challenge than dealing with things like encrypted information. And then even when non-encrypted information was provided, law enforcement faced a range of challenges in understanding how to interpret and how to use that evidence. Um, and so, um, so one of the things that, that we called for in that report was a significant influx of resources to help with the training um, and education of law enforcement. Um, there is an entity within the FBI, the National Domestic Communications and Assistance Center, um, it goes by NENDICAC, um, that um, does this. They do an amazing job with very little resources and particularly um, a very small amount of resources given that there's 18,000 different um, state and local law enforcement entities across this country. And so before we kind of jump to the solution of saying that we need to um, impose these decryption mandates, which for a range of reasons impose all kinds of costs, we've just heard some of them, and we can talk a lot more about what some of those costs might be. I think the first step to do is try to figure out how we better enable law enforcement to lawfully consistent with the rule of law and the privacy protections that are in place um, obtain and use evidence, digital evidence that, that they should be able to access and interpret and use without going down the path of mandating decryption. Right, if I recall, didn't you name your report the low-hanging fruit report? Yes. yes. I, I, think, I think we should come back to that a little bit and talk about some of those options, but I want to give uh, uh, Elena a little bit of a talk, uh, a moment to kind of talk about, again, we heard from Carlos about that intersection about what happens so we just heard from Jen about what's needed to pursue criminals. You exist in both sides of that world. Somebody who needs encryption to be protected, but also people who need law enforcement to protect them. Um, how do you see encryption as a critical aspect to protecting the people who are being abused? And how do you see, I, I assume, you know, from what Jen said, how do you want to see law enforcement go after that low hanging fruit without bothering with back doors to get the people who harm the people that you work with? Yeah, let me start first with that point, actually, Morgan, because um, I think it is a critical one. Obviously, at NNEDV, we, um, we support law enforcement. We often partner with them. We want to see them have everything um, available to them to hold offenders accountable. And um, it, it really is uh, it's a tricky situation, um, but I just want to point out that the moment that you start allowing governments or law enforcement agencies to have that back door potentially into the encrypted information, um, then you create a vulnerability in the system in general. Um, and so, you know, not only is there a vulnerability for hackers, but the reality is that abusers exist in all industries and at all levels of the industries. Um, so they work for the FBI and in law enforcement, they work for tech companies. Um, so it's, it's really kind of that, I think that one critical point where the moment you create a backdoor for what you think is going to be used for good 
um, purposes, um, you still have abusers uh, that potentially work in those industries, right? And they don't stop their abusive behavior the moment that they go to work um, and then start their abuse when they get back home. So I, I just want to point out that that is a tricky situation. And I think there definitely are survivors out there who would give up some level of their privacy and security in order to hold their abuser accountable. But the flip side of that, and this is where I, I think we really need to focus, is that for a lot of domestic violence survivors, a lot of sexual assault survivors, stalking survivors, um, their data privacy, their communications, um, everything that they're doing is so intricately um, connected to their own safety. Um, and that includes um, safety in terms of both just the information about them that's out there, but it can lead and escalate all the way to potentially murder, right? So, so it's a really serious topic um, from that perspective. And this is especially true when we're talking about someone who is in fact living with their abuser and potentially trying to escape that abusive situation. Um, so I just wanna give a very basic example and that's the cell phone. Um, for many of us, including survivors, a cell phone is a lifeline. It is everything that we use to, to work, to communicate with friends and family. It's our support. Um, it's really the one piece of technology that is with us at all times. And unfortunately, it is the one piece of technology that abusers like to target. Um, and this is why encryption can be vital to someone who is trying to leave their abusive situation. And so even right now during this pandemic where people are being forced, unfortunately, and, and asked really to, to stay um, indoors with their potential abuser, having that encryption becomes critical for them to be able to reach out to victim advocates to access resources. Um, we see that oftentimes, especially right now, advocates want to know how they can safely and securely communicate with the victims that they've been communicating with. And that's where encryption really comes into play. So they, they are continuing to do things like check in with the, the survivors, to safety plan with the survivors, to plan exit strategies, to um, relay shelter information, discuss dates and places where potentially they can meet. Um, and so in that sense, it becomes really critical. And I also just wanna point out, it's not even just um, victim advocates working with survivors. It can also be attorneys um, working with their clients. Maybe they are filing for divorce, seeking child custody, they're going to get a protection order. So having that communication, especially right now when a, a survivor could be stuck inside the house with their abuser, um, is just critical. Well, Elena, I want to come back to you with some, for some tips. Um, our, a lot of our audience are Hill staff, and I know that would be helpful for those who want to send notes out to the larger community and to their constituents on what to do if you find yourself in that situation. So warning, I'm, I'm going to come back to you for some tips. But John, um, you know, we've been talking about kind of the individual level. Uh, we heard from Carlos about kind of what it means to an individual. And Elaine and both Carlos talked about the fact that you can be in the same house with somebody who might abuse the information uh, available about you without the ability to protect it. So John, you're working on data, encrypted data that's and huge and about everybody all at once. Um, how do you see as encryption as part of, of what you all do at Sage Bio Networks and what, what you think the future holds and why is encryption important for protecting not just these individual pieces of data, but for us collectively and our, our data as a population? Thank, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so you know, when you're doing collaborative data analysis, uh, you, you, you're operating you're frequently in a high trust environment. And so frequently what you want to do is, is not have data be uh, de-identified as much or encrypted as much because it increases the transactional cost of the computation to have it be encrypted. And so you want that, you know, when you're in a sort of a trusted environment, you don't do a lot of that. Um, what we see is that it's tremendously important though in new ways of, 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 of collaborating with patients who are donating their data to research studies. 
Uh, so it's increasingly the case that you can get your health data on your phone. Um, you know, especially if you have an iPhone, you can get your structured medical record data on your phone, and then you can upload it and transfer it to other places. And so it's really important that, that that data is encrypted. Like we have lots of regulations that require your health data, right? Not research data, but health data to be encrypted at, at rest and in transit because it is so valuable compared to other kinds of data about you. It can be used to obtain insurance. It could be used to obtain medications. Right? It's really, really important that we have a culture of encryption around our individual level medical data, including if we're going to send it off to a research study um, at a place like SAGE. We also spend a lot of time thinking about wearable devices um, and how those wearable devices give us insight into our conditions. You see this now with the smart thermometer data that's come out around COVID, you know, showing Florida outbreaks before the health system picks it up. Uh, but we see again, whether it's a, a fitness wearable or a smart sort of health wearable, um, is that these devices almost never encrypt their data uh, at rest or in transit because they're making these trade-offs at the design level around battery life, which again, you know, encryption is computationally expensive. Um, and so you have this, this problem where you, you have data that can be incredibly uh, revealing um, and it's not encrypted at all. It can be sniffed, it can be captured at, at any given point along the way. And so, so, you know, we really believe in a culture of encryption uh, at, at rest and in transit. Um, and then you decrypt it only when you need inside these kind of high trust analytic communities so that you can actually analyze the data in a meaningful way. But again, it's still encrypted at rest. It's still encrypted at tra in, in transit. It's only decrypted when you're trying to analyze it. Hey, John, do a quick second there. Can you help our audience understand when you say at rest and in transit, Sorry. what do you mean? It's okay. You're here to be the, the nerd. So um, dig Sorry. in. So, so, so I mean, it's very simple. Uh, in transit means when you're sending it from one place to another and at rest means when it's stored. So that if someone breaks into your systems and they access the file, they can't read the file. It's just gobbledygook. Similarly, if somebody catches it along the way, then it's gobbledygook along the way. And both of these steps are just like, they're like hygiene, to be blunt. It's just good. It's it's just it's like washing your hands to keep your data encrypted this way because uh, what you want is is not sort of one magic thing that solves everything, but multiple systems that interconnect that make your systems more secure, and, and that's just, encryption is just really good practice. Well, Carlos, you know you in your op-ed uh, talked a little bit about what John was talking about about the you know the ramifications of data. Um, being available and I was pulling it up while you were talking. You, you mentioned one other thing that I thought was very important. Um, you talked a little bit about the way that uh, if this data is held and a backdoor is created, that the exposure of that data being captured creates some really dangerous scenarios, especially for people, I think you said, whose identity on their government issued identification doesn't match the gender um, that, that they present and, and identify with. And that this kind of this kind of information in the wrong hands is is uh, really bad, uh, life threatening in some cases. Can you talk a little bit because it kind of fits with John's hygiene question of what happens if you have that back door and somebody gets in, somebody doesn't wash their hands? Yeah, I mean, I think we have seen scenarios. For example, in 2014 in Russia, there was a hack of a gay dating site, um, and uh, there was a message that popped up on over you know I think it was over 10,000 accounts that said you're in violation of Russian law and you're subject to go to jail for being on the gay app. And there's a very strong suspicion that the hackers were actually the Russian government um, when this was in the height of the Russian propaganda issues where the Russia, even though um, it's not illegal to be gay in Russia, that's when they passed the laws about gay propaganda. So in Russia, you know, talking about gay issues is considered gay propaganda and that's illegal. So for a lot of the situations for unencrypted data or with backdoors where a government can actually break through these barriers, that completely shatters the safety and kind of the community that can be built in a place like this because you know that you're exposed to being criminally sanctioned for anything you do when you know that the government at any time they want has access to your data simply by criminalizing your behavior. Um, I think in the United States, data breaches um, could expose um, people to losing their jobs, losing their families, 
um, if, if there's a data breach of, you know, a, a gay dating app or a gay site where the data is released, that could be an issue. Um, there was an example a, while, you know, a few years ago with um, Ashley Madison, which was that the website that talks about, you know, people who are having affairs. Unfortunately, there is a men for men section in Ashley Addison, Madison, and there was um, people in Saudi Arabia who were outed for being on that and, you know, anecdotally had to flee and had to, you know, like find a new place to go because they had been outed under a breach of data um, that exposed them as being looking for other men in a country like Saudi Arabia that is completely, um, that, that where the laws are completely uh, anti-LGBT. So the, the ramifications locally and internationally could be great because when you criminalize the behavior, that completely takes away any kind of level playing field or any kind of balance uh, in terms of having a government backdoor. Well, Jen, in January, you were quoted in the Washington Post talking about some of the issues Carlos just hit on. Uh, I'm looking at your actual quote. You said, the reason that Congress has, has failed to legislate up till now is, quote, once you get past the talking points, the range of security, privacy, and economic risks become apparent. Can you talk a little bit about those economic, the risks? I think Carlos kind of nailed some of the privacy risks. Where do you see the economic risks coming from? This goes back to, to what, I, what I was trying to say earlier, is that as we, as we think through these various proposals, it's, it's really important to dig deep and analyze the full range of costs and benefits. And I think one of the reasons why we haven't seen Congress act, despite urging across various administrations for some action on, on, on this issue, this problem of um, so-called going dark, as, as it's often described, is because when you start looking at the costs of doing anything, the costs are quite high. And so one of the costs are the security costs that we've already talked about, that there's cybersecurity risks and there's a lot of nefarious actors that, um, that can, will take advantage of, um, there's a reason why we've moved towards encryption and we've moved towards encryption as a means of protecting our data, our personal data, our national security data, a range of data from, from nefarious actors. And, um, you know, I, I think it's pretty well established that any system, um, there's various rate, ways of doing decryption that can be more or less more or less harmful to security. But once you start going down that road, you make things less secure to some degree or another. There's also economic costs. So um, there's lots of, as for all the reasons that we've just heard, there's lots of users who want to ensure that their data is encrypted for business reasons, for personal reasons, for, for national security reasons, if we're talking about the government. And so if we mandate that US companies provide access to the government pursuant to local process or otherwise, we can start thinking about the reality that business will shift to non-US companies that aren't subject to equivalent mandates. And that is an economic cost for, for US companies that I think we ought to be um, quite concerned about. And relatedly, there's a security cost there too, because the more sophisticated actors who the, the more sophisticated terrorists, the more sophisticated cyber criminals will also recognize that if they move their activities to non-US based providers who are not subject to US decryption mandates, they too can evade um, US law enforcement. And that's important, um, not just because it, it, it puts people outside of the realm of, of the of US being able to access content, which is what we usually think about when we think about encryption, but even when US law enforcement is trying to get access to data and they, they, come, they stumble across encrypted data, they can often get unencrypted metadata, which can be quite useful um, in a range of different ways. And once users shift to companies that are outside of US law enforcement jurisdiction, US law enforcement uses that, loses that ability to get the metadata as well. So those are some of the range of costs that I think yeah. considered in any proposal. So John, I'm gonna to come to you with metadata, not quite the second. I wanna give Elena a chance to talk about something else that just came up, but hold on to metadata is where I wanna go with you, John. Elena, one of the things that was interesting about that though is uh, Jen was talking a little bit about sophistication and you had an interesting blog about stalkerware, which is interesting because it's kind of sophisticated in a lot of social engineering ways. And to make it clear, um, just for everybody on here, 
Uh, the app stores ban stalkerware, and Apple doesn't even allow sideloading, so it's very hard to get on it. But there are ways to use social engineering to kind of get people to do something that's really harmful for them or potentially harmful for them. Can you talk a little bit about your blog on stalkerware and, and a little bit about what people can do to um, make sure that it's not a problem for them, especially in abusive relationships? Yeah, sure. So um, stalkerware or what is I think more broadly called like spyware, which can be downloaded on both a computer and a cell phone. Um, you also sometimes hear them referred to as stalker apps. Um, these are all apps that can be uh, fairly easily downloaded onto phones and computers. Um, and they are tracking and monitoring services. Um, it really allows an individual who wants to spy on somebody the ability to see or hear everything that this person is doing, including websites that are being visited. But I, I think it's important because we keep coming back to this um, issue of encryption. And I think it's important to note that, you know, spyware and, and really the behaviors that surround um, kind of the ability to monitor people, those types of behaviors, that level of technology has been around for a long time. Um, so that is really nothing that's new. But but where where I think the, the issue lies is that encryption um, does provide and can provide an extra layer of security to someone's device. Bear in mind that uh, spyware or software, th these are illegal. Now, you, you've heard um, just last fall, the FTC finally settled with one of the bigger makers of a um, spyware software. Um, and so part of why they were able to do that is because um, because of the lack of privacy and security. But a lot of these companies exist and they market these products as being legitimate. Um, maybe you just want to keep tabs on your workers, right? And so in order for them to work for you, they have to consent to carry around a cell phone that has spyware on it. Um, but, I don't do that at our office. Okay. <laughs> That's good. I That's good. The record. No. Because even with consent, I think it's really <laughs> creepy. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, but when we talk about encryption, you know, it, it's just kind of ridiculous to have this notion that says, well, we really shouldn't um, go too far with this encryption thing because spyware exists anyway. And, you know, these abusers are going to have access to all this information anyway. And, and that's just not the case. I mean, the reality is um, it's always good to have added layers of protection. We all should have passwords or passcodes on our cell phones. We log into our computers with hopefully unique passwords. Um, you know, and once there is something like spyware on a cell phone, um, I, I just want to point out the elephant in, in the room on that. And that's that, sure, your abuser is going to be able to see um, or hear you know, listen in to your conversations. And so they're able to see or hear what you're doing on that cell phone. But just remember that the, the spyware um, that's on there and what that abuser is looking at, that information is only available to that person. That's very different than saying something isn't secure, something isn't private, and that potentially, it, as we were just talking right. about with Jen, it's going to be leaked um, you know, it's going to be hacked and then leaked out. So that's, they're very different topics. They're very different conversations to have. Um, and, and I was thinking about what a good analogy would be. And that's that, you know, we wouldn't go to bed at night and not lock our front doors because we're like, oh, we have so many windows. What if a burglar breaks through, breaks in through the window? So therefore I'm just not going to lock my front door. Right, you don't, we don't think of security and privacy that way. We still lock our doors. We make sure our windows are closed. If you have an alarm system, you might still set that. I mean, so it's just about adding that extra layer of protection. Um, and, and, and that's just, that's the same. Uh, the same is, is true here with encryption and spyware. Um, it, they both exist. They're, you know, one is good, one is not. Um, and, and I think we just try to manage that level of security and privacy, um, both as consumers, but as survivors as well. Well, John, I promised you to get a chance to talk about metadata. Um, uh, 
Are you live? Good. Um, so talk to us a little bit about that because we'll come back around to a couple of other things, but I know that access to that kind of data is critical for doing the kind of research that you need to do to solve global health problems. So talk a little bit about, about you know, how do you view those, the data in that sense and the value of metadata? metadata? Um, well, one of the hard things about like health and medical research is the degree to which it, it is used as a justification for the kind of spyware and stockware that Elena was just talking about, right? Like we talk about public health surveillance without thinking about the fact that we use the same word, right? And so the, one of the reasons that, that we exist as an organization, as a nonprofit, is that it's a structure, research is a structure that lets us actually have honest conversations about the risks and the benefits of using things like metadata, right? And so you don't have this absent research ethics regulation. It's not required unless you're doing regulated human research in the United States, uh, at least. Um, and so what we've, we, it gives us this sort of safe space to explore right, uh, using informed consent and using research protocols, what you can actually learn from sensor data on phones, what you can actually infer from metadata. And so as an example, one of the groups we're working with is called the National, uh, the N3C, the National Collective Cohort Collaborative, sorry, COVID Collaborative, which is gonna be a row level data set coming out of electronic health records data of people who got treated for COVID at the major clinical translational science centers in the United States. Um, it's not de-identified because you have to have dates and you have to have zip codes in a pandemic. You have to track uh, the pandemic across space and time. And so it's really important to have, you know, what you call metadata in the consumer world, right, um, here. Because you can learn some of the most important things you want to learn out of it. But that happens inside a regulated research environment. And that regulation is what makes it possible to do this kind of work. But even then you don't want like row level data being exported out of the system. So you want to govern it in a way where even if you're going to use it, you sort of, you know, you put your hands through the Homer Simpson gloves and you manipulate the data where it lives. You don't get to take it back with you and retrain and train and do other things, transfer it to another party. And it's this, it's this, so you can get this incredible value. Sometimes it's essential to have this kind of extra data. But the point is that it should then have a governance system that's hybridized to its technical environment that is matched to the risks and the benefits. And it's, it's one of the great things about doing regulated research is that we, like, all of our partners have to come to the table and have that conversation, which when we work outside of regulated research, it can be harder to drag people into that environment because they're afraid you can't innovate. But the reality is with encryption and with regulation, you can still do a lot of innovative stuff. You just got to make it a design priority. Well, you know, John, and, and I open this up to anyone else too. One of the key elements that uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the world of HIPAA and business associates, I think that's you, where you and I first um, met. Um, one of the areas that's become very uh, important right now is lessons learned from the uh, HIV crisis and um, finding out ways to both uh, um, solve it as a global health problem, but also individually. Um, that's one of those that structured a lot of the thinking around HIPAA and the value of encryption, as we've all been discussing. Um, I open that up to anyone, but I think that's a question from a public health perspective. What are the lessons that we've learned from uh, our experience um, with HIV and data in the science? I'll let you start, John, if you want, and anybody else can jump in as well. So I, I won't speak to the HIV lessons because I don't know them that uh, oh, before okay. I got into the field. But I will say that from, from a HIPAA perspective, HIPAA was good for when it was passed. Uh, but one of the things I think that, that, that we're in right now is where de-identification as an excuse not to encrypt, for example, is, has failed. Uh, you know, the HIPAA direct identifiers are no longer, right, you know, th that list isn't sufficient. Right. To, we now yep. know a lot about, about re-identification that we didn't know then. And so I think we need to revisit the reality of de-identification, even when you're looking at these Bluetooth contact tracing things that Google and Apple have said, like, oh, it'll be fully de-identified. Well, not if you have the rest of Google and Apple's data. Um, you know, and, and so I, I think that's the biggest thing for me about right now is that HIPAA, the HIPAA de-identification safe harbor allows the sale of data uh, under HIPAA in a way that, it, that, that is not what people think it does. And right. it's far more permissive and invasive than it probably ought to be, given that you can use advanced math to re-identify way faster now than you used to. Right. 
it's, it's one of those things. So Elena, I promised you an opportunity, I'm looking at the clock, to kind of talk about um, the ways, the lessons that people should learn, um, what to do, and what are the advice you give the congressional staff who are on this? Uh, one of the areas to think about is, is there's kind of two scenarios, right? Um, if you live in a household with um, someone who is abusing you, um, encryption is important for your ability to reach out safely. And Carlos touched on that same issue. Um, you've also got the law enforcement question of how do you, uh, how do you kind of um, reach out to law enforcement and share them to any data that your abuser might have? And this is one of the questions we've kind of been asked is, how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with that cross-pollination? What are the advice that you give uh, to people to think about? Um, what's the hygiene they should practice? What are the, what are the things that they should consider? And, and um, obviously, where are the resources that people can go to to get help if they are in an abusive situation? Yeah, when you say what, um, I just wanna be sure I understand, you're asking what advice potentially um, for Hill staffers listening in or? Well, when, and for I think, let's talk about two communities, right? Hill staffers who need to be able to um, write to constituents about things that people should know in the broadest possible terms, but also speaking to an audience who um, may have their own experiences and their own family members who need advice. So what are yeah. the two things that they need to know, both to broadcast to the world, but also as individuals who may be living in situations that are, um, are dangerous. Sure. Well, I want to point out, um, and that's part of why, you know, again, thank you for having us, part of why we're here today. I do want to point out that really end-to-end -end encryption can save lives. It really can. Um, and that's just the reality of it. Because when a survivor is able to safely communicate, whether it's um, through chat or on, on a call, um, when they are able to do that and they're able to receive resources, they are able to receive um, information, uh, again, even just things like legal strategies, it, it can make all the difference in the world to not only just their well being, but their, their actual lives. So, a lot is at stake. And so, for anyone out there who's listening that has any type of ability to change, um, how we look at this and the lens through which we look at it, I just want to point out that it can be, and Carlos said this too, it can be a matter of life and death. Um, and, and that really is the case for so many survivors. In terms of what people can do, look, there are a lot of platforms out there, especially now we are seeing just this um, surge of uh, communication, online platforms that are being um, develop, they're revamping it. Zoom allegedly is revamping some of their um, privacy policies. And so I think people are really wanting to um, jump on this kind of bandwagon during this time and take advantage of it and say, how can we make our platforms more secure for these vulnerable populations? And so we have a lot of different resources on our websites. We have been uh, no joke, we've been rolling out resources in light of COVID um, since the moment we all say that again, you're, you're muted. Tell us what your website is. <laughs> oh, uh, yes. So you can go to, well, you, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Morgan. So you can always go to nnedv.org. Um, we have a lot of resources there, but, you know, we didn't get into, I don't think, um, any of our like expertise, but I'm on the safety net project where we really look at the intersection of technology and um, abusive behaviors. And so if you go to techsafety.org, that's where we have a lot of our resources. Um, so if you're looking to communicate safely, especially right now, if you're at home and you just need to reach out to somebody, we have suggestions for that. If you know Excellent. some. If you know someone who is potentially in this type of situation, we just rolled out a new resource. It's up on our website about how to maybe talk to that person and provide support without necessarily getting them, you know, in trouble. Um, so go to techsafety.org. So um, I'm going to try to roll a couple of the audience questions together. There's about three of them that cover the same thing. Jen Daskal. Um, there's 
a, I, I would call it a misperception, I'll editorialize here, that encryption is um, somehow prevents law enforcement from having access, that somehow magically, um, you know, the lawyers for the defense or the prosecution aren't, it, it magically disappears. Um, with a warrant, uh, there are ways to um, access information and metadata and other data that, can you help talk us through why um, encryption isn't really going dark in the way that people think of it? You touched a bit on this on your low-hanging fruit paper, but and also in your congressional testimony. Why is that not a true dichotomy? So, so just starting with the warrant issue. So the issue with encryption is not about um, whether or not will law enforcement can get a warrant. Law enforcement can get a warrant. The question then becomes what useful information can law enforcement access with that warrant. And so as data is encrypted, um, and you know, this is, this is part of the high profile debate between the FBI and Apple in the wake of the San Bernardino um, killings, there was, there's a question about what, what can, what is available to be provided to, to law enforcement. And so it's certainly the case that at times the fact that data is encrypted means that there's certain information that can't be provided that law enforcement wants. Um, there are, as we talked about in the low-hanging fruit paper, also often a range of other um, types of information or means of accessing the specific information. In that particular case, in fact, um, rather than um, mandating decryption, law enforcement ultimately was able to access that particular information with the help of, of an external um, company. Um, right. I want to I want to stop you there. You you said can't be provided, and I think that's part of the confusion that exists in this space. Um, it it it's no different than if I had an uncrackable safe in my house, right? Or it was it was difficult, or I wrote in a secret language that only I knew. The the mere fact that law enforcement can find a piece of paper where I've recorded my thoughts and my location, but I did it in a cipher that they can't figure out, isn't any different. So the you use the term can't be provided. And that's one of the things that I think gets misunderstood. Yes, yeah, so that, that was, I, so, so, I, so thanks for, for, for catching that. Um, it's not that it, it can't be provided. So law enforcement gets a warrant and says, turn over this information. Um, and in certain, and if the data is encrypted, for example, it might be turned over in a form that's totally unreadable or in other situations it might not be accessible. Um, by a company, um, but you're absolutely right that um, this is not necessarily a new problem. Um, that's always been the case that there was certain information that could be helpful to government officials conducting investigations that's simply not available because the piece of paper with the code on it is in an unbreakable safe or it's been burned or it's been destroyed. And so there is this assumption, I think, with digital evidence that it's going to last forever and that it's always available and therefore um, law enforcement should always be able to access it at all times. And I think um, that becomes a dangerous assumption if that becomes the presumption on which policy is based because that presumption runs against everything we've been talking about for the last hour in terms of risks to individuals and their rights and their liberties and also poses a whole host of other security costs as well. So you're really, right. in many cases, balancing security versus security. I highly, for those who, who are interested in this, I highly, highly recommend a piece by Jim Baker on law yeah. fair that talks about his evolution in thinking about these issues. He was the general counsel of the FBI um, and wrote a really thoughtful and thought-provoking piece about how he th has thought and has how his thinking has evolved on um, these issues as he's thought through the complexity and tried to understand why, in fact, it is the case that despite multiple efforts, Congress hasn't passed a decryption mandate because once you start digging into this, you realize how much more complex it is than kind of any simple talking point suggests. Right. One of the questions was, and this is Elena, and I want to get Carlos back into this, but one of the questions was, well, if the abuser is taking pictures of you with their phone and it's encrypted, um, the, the, you know, well, isn't that, isn't that law enforcement? Shouldn't you have a back door to that? That's really no different than if I took Polaroids of you and hid them in the backyard. The court can't compel me to tell you where I dug the hole. Um, 
in in a certain way, I mean, it's a horrible, horrible thing. But uh, it your ability to compel somebody to give them up is, you know, structured under our existing amendments and our existing case law. So it, it's one of those where I understand the questioner's point, but I think it's um, a question of well, uh, if I can, then I must. And I think Jen, what you were saying is is that's a dangerous slope to go down. The if you can, you must, and and I think presents a real conflict. Am I right on that, Jen and Elena? That's the, the simple danger that exists there? I mean, the, with the warrant, if a warrant is served on the service provider and service provider has access to that information, the service provider has to turn over exactly. that information. But exactly. in the San Bernardino case, for what, the, the situation that was, was in that case is that the cell, after a certain number of attempts to unlock the cell phone, the cell phone locked. And Apple, in that case, did not... Um, have any means of accessing the information on the cell phone because they put in this system in order to protect users and in order to protect the, the security of users' data and the privacy of users as well. And so in that case, um, the debate was about whether or not the gov whether or not Apple could be compelled to basically build a new system that would allow law enforcement in. And ultimately, the case was, was mooted because um, law enforcement found an alternative way to get what it needed, um, which um, again highlights the the need for creativity on all sides, including on the law enforcement side, to think through ways, alternative ways of getting access without going down the road of mandating, you know, across the board some sort of decryption mandate on either data at rest or data in motion, which is even more dangerous for all kinds of reasons. Right. I think, I think this gets into this false dichotomy that somehow um, that end-to-end -end encryption um, uh, somehow prevents law enforcement in a way that, that I think, back to your low-hanging fruit article, uh, it isn't as though these things didn't all exist prior to the existence of the cell phone. All the same problems, the same uh, way to do it. This is merely saying, well, if I can, then you must you must make it possible. Um, but Carlos, I, I kind of want to we kind of flog that that topic a bit. Um, I think the real question that I, I want to go back to where we're all talking about is, um, how do you see the long term benefit of encryption in terms of building communities for the LGBT space? You talked a lot about countries where it's illegal. Do you see end-to-end -end encryption and communication methodologies like this allowing those people to know they're not alone? I'm kind of feeding this to you, but you know, help, how do you help see that helping to build what amounts to the structure that needs to be done to build a legal framework so that these 74 countries that um, you know, can literally put you to death, um, that there's enough people that can group together to move against that. Talk a little bit about how that safety um, allows for communities to be built to know that you're not alone. Sure. And I think this goes a little bit back to the um, Jen's statement about the false dichotomy. And I think there is a problem here where it's like law enforcement is right. And, you know, any attempt to block them from doing their job is something that should be prevented. But there is a false dichotomy there. And I think one of the issues that we're talking about is the ability for communities like the LGBT community to mobilize and to be able to have conversations in places where they may not be welcome or they may not be even legal. Um, I think you see a lot of this with journalism. I think, you know, there was a whole conversation about Egypt and kind of the spring revolution and how Twitter was being used for these things. I think the LGBT communities have the same kind of opportunity in these countries to mobilize and to be able to organize and, you know, and have open conversations about the threats and the dangers that are being posed by these governments uh, without encryption and with the knowledge that a government has access to, you know, the encrypted information, either, you know, either in motion or at rest, there's no way to have an open discussion um, to make change. So encryption is probably the strongest tool that minority communities, disadvantaged communities has in regimes like this in order to be able to organize and fight back against the, uh, the oppression. So I was looking up some of the other elements of where I've seen, it, and I think your your example is well, um, well taken. Um, we're a little bit already over where we were going. Um, Stephen, um, are there elements that you want to hit? I'm trying to get the I'm trying to wrap up a bunch of the questions um, as we go along. We've got enough questions here that I'm kind of doing them live and rolling them together. 
um, are there specific elements that you guys deal with at FOSI, which is all about family um, and, and children's safety? Um, how are you looking at the, uh, in the environment right now to build tools and capability to keep kids safe and really more families safe, uh, which is, huh, it's right there in your name. Yeah, thanks, Morgan. This has been a fascinating discussion. Um, first of all, I just want to make sure that people are aware that we are not like NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They are dealing with the worst of the worst, the child sexual abuse imagery, the child exploitation, and so on. Um, we are more in the sphere of, um, of education, of parental controls, of dealing with, you know, still difficult and challenging issues like cyberbullying and sexting and so on, uh, overuse, oversharing, screen time, those sorts of uh, concerns, as well as the benefits of technology. And look at what we're seeing with uh, online schooling going on right now. Um, there is a point though, and I've seen a couple of questions starting to come through on this. Um, we are aware of the, dis of the debate around the fact that encryption would obviously make it harder to detect child sexual abuse imagery uh, being transmitted. And what we've been learning um, from the creator of PhotoDNA, by the way, PhotoDNA uh, created first by Microsoft some years ago, then shared across the industry, uh, a way to uh, see transmitted images, known transmitted images of child sexual abuse material. Can, it can be used and adapted with encrypted services. So that's the first thing to say. I think that there was a, a considerable amount of, of, of concern uh, particularly with Facebook's announcement of, of going uh, encrypted, that they wouldn't be able to therefore capture uh, the transmission of those images. And, and I'm, I am not uh, a technologist per se. I'm not, uh, and I can't speak to the um, specifications of photo DNA, but my understanding from everything I've read is that it can be adapted and used. I think there's also another area here um, that we've not really touched on, which is the, for, for, for families and for kids, is the whole range of preventative and educational efforts that um, are going on, but so much more needs to be done. And, and we hugely support um, the idea of law enforcement being fully resourced in order uh, to tackle the, the sorts of issues that they want to, to deal with so that they can do their jobs. Um, but we'd also love to see more in the way of preventative educational work, maybe through the ICACs, uh, the um, centers for the, I'm trying to remember what that acronym stands for now, Internet um, Cyber Crimes, ah, someone will, will send it in in the remarks. Um, but in other words, they, they, they do a lot of educational work in communities um, to show kids uh, uh, how to recognize um, the kinds of um, predatory behavior or the means by which um, images, sexual images could be solicited. Uh, and we just wanna see more of that uh, being available um, across the country in a coherent national strategy, uh, rather than this sort of piecemeal approach that we've had so, so far. Well, great point. Um, I've got a couple, again, we've got enough questions here. I'm trying to roll things together. John, I wanna give you a chance to talk about something um, on the technical side. One of the questions is dealing with the fact that um, encryption for groups, what Carlos was sitting on, doesn't scale super well, right? Signal maxes out at 10 people. Um, and I think this gets back to some of the questions around, well, images being shared, et cetera. There are kind of structural issues that happen to do encryption for groups and for organizing. What are the technical issues um, that you see in that exist for doing um, encryption for groups? And where are the weaknesses there and the strengths there? So, you know, not being an encryption technologist myself, I can only karaoke the ones that I've talked to. But I mean, a lot of yep. the big issues, I mean, it really comes down to computational cost. When you're trying to analyze data, which is where we sort of see it, um, you're already spending a lot of money on compute, right? And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a, you know, adding orders of magnitude to that cost is, is painful. And so one of the biggest things that we advocate for is, is simply more research into better encryption technologies so that it is not to create back doors, uh, but instead to make it less computationally painful. 
would be one of the best, and that would have these knock-on effects of making data analysis cheaper under encryption, as well as making it cheaper for startups like Signal to incorporate, you know, low-cost encryption. Um, but the, the the biggest piece of it is that fundamentally people tend to want uh, frictionless experiences, and that's true of a data scientist just as much as it is of a of, of a consumer. And and right now, encryption, it's it's you know, the math is there, the math is well known, but we don't have right, really good user interfaces for a developer who might not be a decryption, an encryption expert to easily add encryption to his or her technologies. And so right. I think for the most part, we've got what we need. We need to have better toolkits so that it's easier for people to add it to their products. And we need some federal investment in the, in the fundamental science of it to draw down the computational costs of it. And if you have those two things, if it's cheap and easy to add to your app, then you'll add it to your app, right? The, the issue is that it's neither cheap nor easy right now. And, and that's right. something that can be fixed. So Elena, um, a lot of questions there um, directed at you about advice on um, what tools do you recommend? What apps do you recommend for those who are experiencing domestic violence? And Carlos, if you have similar ones for the LGBT community about um, ways that they can be safe and protected um, and communicate uh, what they're facing, I'll, I'll let Elena go first. Yeah, that's it's such a great question. And you know, Morgan, I wish I could um, really answer with this is exactly what we recommend. But the reality is we've especially the last few weeks, we have gone over and over this so many times and we've come together as a team and discussed it. Um, we really can't endorse um, any one particular platform. We did come up with a communication platform comparison chart that is on our website. Again, that's techsafety.org. And in it, we look at um, a handful of the platforms that we have been not only working with, but seeing a lot in the field. We um, are seeing and hearing a lot of questions around them. So we developed this kind of comparison chart to, to look at those. Those platforms, I'll just list them that are on that, are Groovio. So Groovio is a, um, also encrypted site. They can do video um, and voice and chat. Um, I think the chat is just in the video uh, feature, but it's a, it's encrypted. Um, the other one is Cyph, C-Y-P-H. Um, that is encrypted as well. They are also working towards uh, coming up with like accessi accessible features. So a lot of these platforms don't address accessibility. So if you need um, interpretation, whether it's sign language or um, English to Spanish, anything like that, a lot of these platforms aren't addressing that. We oddly enough do list Zoom uh, in that chart um, because we want people to have all the information. So we just list the facts. So, so far we have Groovio, Scythe, Zoom. Um, uh, the other one is doxy.me. That was a new one, so we included it. I think that's more of a telehealth help, uh, app. Um, and then the final one is Resource Connect. Did I already list that one? Sorry if I, if I did. Um, but again, these are, these are all good platforms. There are pluses yeah. and minuses. Not everyone is perfect. Some you'll love the features of others. You're like, I wish it had this. Um, but, but go to our website and look at that chart, that comparison chart. Um, and you can at least weigh the pros and cons, whether you're a person wanting to use it, just an individual or you're an agency, right? So you're a domestic violence agency wanting to offer your services. Um, look at that and decide what's best for you and what's best um, for the survivor. Let them pick that. That would be probably my number one tip is if the survivor says, I only want to use Zoom and that works for me, well, then great. Then Zoom it is. Um, I think, Carlos, do you have a couple that you want to talk about? And then, sure, Jen, I've got a, one to come back to you. I'm going to roll about four questions together here. For you, Jen. We don't have those apps either, but I, I know that anecdotally, and as we work with uh, LGBT youth, a lot of the apps that come up, like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and Instagram, we do advise everyone to make sure that their encryption is obviously turned on to the extent that it's optional. Um, so privacy is very important. So rather than um, work with specific apps, we work with just information and education around encryption and making sure that you know any anytime there's a change in it or there's or there is a, a, a way to turn it on, toggle it on or off, that we're making sure that the centers we work with and the youth that we work with 
are aware of this and are using that as a default uh, for their communications. Excellent. So, Jen, one of the things that keeps coming up, it, it feels like this is there's a very binary conversation. Um, I think we all agree that we need encryption for things like banking, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, no backdoor, uh, backdoors would be a terrible idea there. But others are saying, well, what do we do about exploitative material and the fact that it could be, it could be moved around? Jen, you brought up the fact that um, criminals will go, if that were actually the place, then you're going to see uh, criminals moving to the applications that provide encryption. And so it's not as though just um, telling all the big companies that they, that they can't use encryption, that it will magically stop any uh, exploitative material moving around because it'll just move to um, apps that um, aren't governed by our laws and, and allow for end-to-end -end encryption. And that that's, the internet's kind of global. You touched on that on like, you used the example of terrorists, but isn't it the same for other misabuse of information? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, we're not, we, we, we tend to look at these things in a, in a static setting, but the world is obviously quite dynamic and sophisticated actors um, who are um, trying to deliberately evade um, law enforcement and are sophisticated about it will find tools and those tools will continue to exist that allow them to communicate in ways that are designed to detect, um, to, to evade access by, by law enforcement. And um, it's, I think, um, pretty, apparent that if that there's you know even if we're talking about law enforcement seeking access from u.s based tech companies that are using strong encryption there's a range of other um, forms of of connected data metadata and other things even encrypted metadata can provide useful information at times um, that is available from u.s based companies that becomes exceedingly hard to get once you're talking about um, entities that are outside the U.S. jurisdiction or people are moving increasingly to, to what's known as the dark web. Um, and so um, it increases the cost for everybody and increases the cost for, for nefarious actors, but sophisticated nefarious actors, the ones we're most concerned about, will likely find ways to find the tools that allow them to communicate in ways designed to evade um, authorities. And meanwhile, um, there are the range of costs that we've just been spending a lot of time talking about that results from um, from looser encryption standards or decryption mandates. Morgan, I think you're muted. One of the things that we all know is for a long time prior to the internet, um, people would send um, exploit uh, exploitative material through the mail. And, you know, the mail didn't the, the post office didn't open every letter to check for it. And uh, even though it wasn't encrypted, it certainly was the case where, um, where the, the post office wasn't opening every mail. Um, and you can't, I don't want a world where the platforms or others are literally opening every piece of mail that I have um, and reading it through. It's, um, it's risky. There's a lot of bad things that can happen when governments do that. Uh, Obviously, seeking a solution for um, exploitative material is, is something we need to do, and Balcom touched on ways that we can do it. But I also don't think, this is my opinion, and I don't know what you think, Jen, but I don't think putting a back door in or breaking encryption is a solution, given the purpose of encryption writ broadly, uh, that we've heard from Elena and Carlos and John when it comes to health, domestic violence, and the LGBT community. What do you think, Jen? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I already mentioned um, the Jim Baker, Jim Baker piece in Lawfare. I'd also point people to there was, a, there was a really fantastic report by the Carnegie Endowment that was looking in depth at this issue. And there too, I mean, they, they talked about, at a minimum, if you're going to go, if you're, as we start talking about this, we need to um, talk about, keep, separate our discussion of data in motion and data at rest. And once we start talking about um, decryption mandates for data in motion, we are really going down a path that's incredibly um, dangerous for all the reasons that we've just talked about. Data in motion, data at rest is, is a little bit more complicated, but here too, again, I think before anybody starts thinking about um, mandates or rules that would enable, again, pursuant to lawful access orders, um, law enforcement right. access, what would otherwise be encrypted data at rest, we have to think through all of the costs that come with that as well. 
Well, we've had about 20 questions. I hope several of them for anonymous. I've been trying to build them into kind of an ongoing discussion. Uh, we've talked a bit about the exploitative material, uh, the balancing act. Um, Balcom touched on a little bit on some abilities to do it. Uh, we've a lot of questions uh, for Elena on, on the domestic violence angle, several for Carlos about, uh, about tools for LGBT. Thank you to anonymous attendee um, asking about um, why don't we have better, uh, better encryption capabilities for groups and for organization? I think that's a great question. Um, John gave a good answer, but I think, thank you to anonymous attendee. I think that's one that we should look at and explore in a post or a, um, a paper. Uh, it's a great question to ask. Um, we're 18 minutes over where we were supposed to be, but it's been a great back and forth. Uh, Mr. Balcom, um, as my co-host, I turn it over for you to the last word and to send us out. Well, thank you very much, Morgan, and to each of our panelists. Um, I've learned a great deal from this. Um, I, I, I would just simply say this is an extremely complex question. It is not an easy uh, black and white. Uh, there's, there is no easy black and white responses. Uh, obviously, encryption has enormous benefits uh, for uh, for privacy, but also, as we've learned, uh, for for safety uh, uh, of individuals as well. Um, but we also have to work with law enforcement. We've got to figure it out for them, uh, either technologically, but also through other efforts, including education and getting out ahead of uh, many of these issues. And the pandemic is only accentuating the extraordinary uh, suffering that it goes on in the hands of, uh, of children and young adults uh, in the hands of their abusers with the uh, spike that we've been reading about in terms of child sexual uh, abuse and imagery that's passing across the internet. So we've got to keep talking about this. We've got to keep exploring this um, while keeping ex very alive to the unintended consequences of a fairly simplistic answer, which says we must have a way in to the back door of any encrypted services. Um, so let's keep talking, let's keep working, uh, let's keep supporting each other uh, and see if we can uh, square or thread this needle as we like to say at FOSI. And so I wanna thank all of our panelists to Carlos, Elena, Jen and John, um, amazing work. Um, I will give each of you, if you, have a, if you have a second, you wanna plug anything that you're doing, feels like a podcast. Carlos, where should they visit? Sure, we have a one sheet that we developed for LGBT, to, uh, for LGBT communities and encryption, and you can get that at our website, lgbttech.org. Elena? Yeah, if you go to techsafety.org, um, there's a digital services toolkit for service providers. There's also a survivor toolkit if you are dealing with domestic violence. Jen? Um, I'll just I'll plug a new our new tech law and security uh, program at American University, which we just launched in February, and we are doing um, a range of work on privacy and surveillance, particularly in the wake of the coronavirus as well. And John, uh, I don't have anything relevant to plug, so I'll just tell you make a donation to a, a local food bank. Excellent. And with that, um, please stay safe, stay at home, um, and find something interesting to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Appreciate it.